I'm going to make some important announcements now, so just kind of write them down. On uh, when is that meeting? Wednesday the 27th. Wednesday the 27th over in Coeur Lane at the Kootenai uh, Center. Uh, uh, what's they're going to be having a, a special uh, program on the medicines used in Parkinson's and how they work and how they counterindicate other things that might be going one way or another. So that's going to be uh, the 24th, did you say, Jackie? Wednesday the 27th. Wednesday the 20, 27th. It's going to be Dr. Steve Setters from WSA School of Pharmacy, and his uh, partner will be over there will be Lindy Wood, who's going to be setting up one in, through Dr. Greeley's office, the same thing where you can get your meds analyzed. And, and it's, uh, it's going to be a, an awful big project, but we can put it together as long as we get enough people and whatnot to get it going. The other important thing is our facilities. We have to thank those people that make these announcements possible. For example, Northwest Parkinson's over in Seattle is the same type of group that we are, helping the patients and the caregivers. And they, uh, they pay for the airtime here, which is quite expensive, and we really appreciate their help. Number two is Albertson Supermarkets uh, and, and Save on Drugstores. They're owned by the same people, and they operate here, here in Spokane. They give a considerable cash amount. I think they're getting close to 50000 now they've given in over the years that we've had them. So uh, that's real nice that they give us that grant every year. And then the other most important, the most important thing of all is our speaker is a highly qualified individual. He's retired from the school district where he did some work with penmanship and whatnot. Now he's in the computer business, and uh, they're just doing wonderfully well. And he has to catch an airplane out of Spokane at 3.15. So when we come to the talking on the tele, letting the calls come in, I might have to stand up and say, whoa, party's over. And then we got to get him out of here. And we can stay around and talk and chat. I see we didn't get our coffee and donuts today. They say they say they're bringing it. That doesn't do you people in TV land any good, does it? <laughs> but it'll sure help us. And uh, so, I, with no with no further ado, I'm going to introduce George Amon. He's a, a big uh, activist on the exercise too. He has Parkinson's and he exercises way more than I do, and you can, you can, you can tell a difference. I'm a different shape than he is. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. I appreciate your time today. You Thank you. George Amon. Thank you. Let's see if we can get the, get moved around here. There we go, so we don't uh, put the pieces in front. First of all, just a, a little disclaimer. I'm not sure there's anything uh, like a penmanship expert anymore. Uh, the, uh, if you go into the K-12 systems today, uh, penmanship, which you and I learned as kids, is not what's really taught. Uh, the, now today they really focus on manuscript instruction, which is really the block letters that we used to work with, and, that, uh, and then keyboarding skills, working, on, working with computers, because that's where a lot of the uh, challenges uh, come uh, to uh, express kids uh, themselves in writing, is they, they type it. They put it onto the, onto the computer. The, so, so just, I'm not an expert. Uh, I did do 30 years in the K-12 system. Uh, eight of those years I was teaching elementary school. I taught junior high school. I taught high school. I was a high school administrator, and I was a central office staff person my last seven years in, in the education system uh, dealing with technology. And they've got some really great technology for us to work with a little bit here today. The... Um, the uh, a little bit about penmanship. Uh, we, we talk a bit about that, and we say, you know, we, uh, those of us did it. I mean, in this group, who, who had to take cursive penmanship when you were in elementary school? And who, who had your, pe your handwriting evaluated and you got grades on it? And you remember all those really fun things and stuff? Okay, for the most of you, most of us at our age, that's what happened. Um, the penmanship that we worked depending on your age, was, was based on, on a couple of different models. And uh, a little bit about that. In the 1800s, uh, there were essentially two models of penmanship. Uh, the Spencerian uh, models, uh, there were two Spencerian models, and that's what they were uh, taught. 
And, and if, to see, when you see a Spencerian model penmanship, it has lots of flourishes on the top, you know, and there are little, little curly cues that are associated with that. And, and that it was used almost as an art form. Um, the uh, practice of it was taught in, uh, in special schools, and uh, today ma many of our calligraphy items come out of those schools that taught Spencerian um, penmanship. In, um, well, first, in 1859, a, a young man uh, was born, uh, August Norman uh, Palmer, and that uh, as he grew up to be, he grew up in the business industry, and the, in the late 1800s, late uh, 19th century, he would uh, he, he had the option of, of writing, and he took the job of, of being a uh, a copyist. In the eight, late 1800s, the typewriter had just barely been invented; nobody used it, so legal records, all legal records, were hand copied. And so there were major career fields where people would all they do is do everything by handwriting. And, and so it's an entire industry. One of the problems that they had with that was is that the, there was only so much time that um, someone who was doing, practicing the handwriting, they, before they wear out, they're, they'd get too tired. And Palmer kind of looked at that and said, what are we going to do about that? And he, um, he watched that and he observed uh, the Spencerian uh, font and the Spencerian handwriting technique, and he discovered that, that most of them would lay, keep their ar elbows up, off, arm off of the, uh, the table, and they would do this flourish. And so this motion of the arm was, a, was, was what was active. He modified that, and he said, let's put our arm down on the tabletop so it rests on the tabletop, and created the alphabet that most of us worked with, the Palmer alphabet. Uh, a little later on, those of us who are local, we're going to practice some of the techniques that he used, what are called full arm techniques. And that uh, those of you who are uh, at remote sites, if you had some paper and that uh, what you really want to do it with is a crayon, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But uh, if you've got something that you can see, you, we'll, we'll practice a little bit as we go. How did I get here? Um, Born in uh, the Northwest, my father's a physician and uh, was raised in the Central Valley School District. When I was uh, seven years old, my youngest brother um, had a severe injury and he burned his arm badly. And so my mother would keep me home uh, during the days to help take care of uh, my brother and uh, especially help bandage him. To keep me occupied, and for other reasons, uh, she painted one wall in the house, a wall about 20 feet long, 8 feet tall, black, flat black, chalkboard black. Right in the middle of it stood the red telephone. And then she had a little tray, and it was covered with chalk. And so what would happen is while I was waiting, she would say, all right, do circles. And so I would, on this blackboard, for hours at a time, draw circles on the board. And it shaped, and I, I never knew where she got the idea, but I would do that, you know, and, and then she'd say, okay, I need your help, and I'd go in, and she kept all the messy stuff out of my sight, and then I would help her bandage my brother. Years later, I was in uh, teacher training, and I uh, had, you have to, if you're in teacher training, you have to learn how to teach penmanship. That's one of the things I was taught elementary school. And the, uh, we went through the process of learning the new fonts. Uh, some of the, I'm gonna, some of those fonts, uh, Zaner Bloser, how many remember Zaner Bloser? Okay, don't remember Zaner Bloser. Denelian, don't remember Denelian. Or uh, here's one I, I, I can show you here. I gotta get my screen going a bit better now. Yeah, I'll get the lights. I think that this one goes down. And we'll see if we're on here. Well, while we're trying to figure out what's coming up, the, um, the uh, fonts changed, and we had to learn all those things, and you had to take a test as a teacher to learn to, to practice your fonts, and you, if you didn't, you had to take a remedial course. This was at Whitworth College back in the early 70s. 
And then uh, I went on and I started to teach. I was teaching in a school district in the Spokane Valley, and I have uh, this episode where I had these two young men, uh, Jason and Paul, who could not write. Uh, they were great athletes. They were really bright kids, uh, and but they just struggled with it. And so I said, well, you know, how do we make, how do we improve that? And so, and this is back when blackboards were black and whiteboards didn't exist. Oh, they moved, they changed my, changed my input. My apologies. I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, and so they, they, they were struggling with that. And I said, okay, guys, up to the board. And so we went up to the blackboard with a piece of chalk, and we started practicing Palmer. Palmer technique is what my mom taught me, and I didn't know that until I'd gotten to college. Uh, but they would practice this, and they, recess after recess, they would say, Mr. Amon, we're going to make, and we're going to make more circles. And I said, Yep, you're going to make more circles. The end result of which is they both became very good penman, penmanship uh, users, and uh, went on to become real uh, reliable priests. Uh, Jason Moffat is a dentist in the Spokane Valley, as is Paul Damon, the two young men who is a dentist in the Spokane Valley, who are the two young men that I worked with in that time. The, those of us who have Parkinson's know that one of the challenges that we have is that it, we tend to lose some of the muscle control. And that um, that happens to me just like it happens to you. And, then we, and, it, and, and I start to say, all right, how do I deal with that? Um, how do I keep my penmanship uh, legible? And so I began uh, working some of the processes that uh, I'm going to show you now. Uh, some basic assumptions. Um, Parkinson's people have problems with penmanship. Basic assumption. Uh, good penmanship is a function uh, more of large motion uh, control than it is small fine motor control. Um, improving pen penmanship or anything else that's physical is uh, in a direct result of practice and conditioning. So even if you don't have Parkinson's and you want to improve your penmanship, there are ways to do that. But if you don't practice it, it doesn't get any better. One of the things I taught was computer science years ago, and that uh, we sat down and we, uh, with the kids. And the first day of class, I'd say, um, you know, we need to talk about programming, talk about how you get better at certain things. And the, in the example, we'd say, I'd say, a program doesn't always write, you can't always write a good program about everything. Can't write a good program that teaches you how to pen, do penmanship. And the example I said is that if you think you can write a good program, write me a program on how to tie your shoes. You know, and so the challenge was is that there are some things that you don't really learn by the words that describe it. Some things you have to learn by doing. And penmanship is one of those things. It's the practice. Now where would my crayon go here? Some of you have seen this one. It, does this penmanship look normal to you? Anybody write like that? Auto focus. Uh, just if we can brighten it up with the iris. Let's see here. There we go. Yeah, it's really small. <laughs> How about this one? Okay, that's a challenge, and part as we go through the examples today, you, you may you'll you you may see me all of a sudden just the pen just goes off the edge there, pencil goes off the crayon goes off the edge. Why crayons and why newsprint? Friction. When you write, when you use the crayon on the newsprint, there's more friction, and it forces your hand and your arm to work harder at the practice that you're going to do. So you want to do that. The best place to practice, if you wanted to really practice, would be on a, on a blackboard itself. Or um, in this case, we're going to do a whiteboard. Okay. So I'm going to step over to the, the, just for a second here, and we're going to practice a little bit on this line. Is my mic still on? Sounds like I'm there. And uh, if you want to volunteer to try this, you can try this yourselves. 
there are three basic motions that form the letters of the cursive alphabet, be it Danielian, be it Zaner Bloser, be it uh, handwriting without tears. There are forward rolls. There are backward rolls. This one went over the top. Now I'm going to go on, on the bottom. And there are push pulls. Those are the basic strokes of every piece of the alphabet. That's what we what we what we need to practice. Um, the my mother back to the days when I stood on the blackboard waiting there. She would say, "Make donuts," and I'm going to do a real quick donut here. Palmer, back to him, he says. Lay your arm there, and as you draw, as you use the, make them, create the motions that you want to use here, think about riding those emotions with your elbow. Don't think about your hand. Hold your hand fixed. Draw with your elbow. Whole arm. So it looks like this. You can even do that on your piece of paper. Those of you who are here with us, would you pick up your crayons? And see if you can you get a hold of the crayon and draw inside of the lines that are there. And I'll do in a couple of examples here now. Notice that my fingers don't move. It's my whole arm and my whole hand. Practice. So we're trying it here. Can we get these guys to see what they're doing? Uh, yeah. Takes practice. Think about using your elbow. Use your elbow. And if you have trouble with that smaller one, think of a bigger one. Use two lines. You, you, you rest your hand there, you do, but you don't put any pressure on that heel. The question is, do you rest your hand? You don't put the pressure on your heel. You're just resting on your arm. You're not pushing down. You're thinking you're just, the idea is you're making the circles. And, if, and, and the smaller circle is not necessarily the best place to begin. Think of a big circle. So in this kind of a, tr a kind of a drill, what you do is you'd work your big circles, forward rolls, forward circles, backward circles, and your push pulls, and then try and see where your alphabet is. Just write you know a few of the characters in your alphabet. And again, you're you're thinking big, using your whole arm, not just your hand. You want to use your whole arm. Move that arm there. For some of us, that's, that's a real challenge. If I were doing this left-handed, it'd really be a work for me. Periodically, it's work for me on the right hand. It'll jump, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Push pulls. And then start shaping some of your letters. Again. Focus on using your arm, not just your hand. Use your whole arm. By practicing in the ways that we just discussed, you, you can then begin to develop the skill. It's important to think big. I mean, even, even if you're making a half-inch letter, make it an inch letter. Make it two-inch letter. Or if you can work at the board, make it a six-inch letter. 
deal with the letters and and the, but again whole arm that was what Palmer that was his contribution to penmanship was whole arm style whole arm technique although if you let it ride on the table he uh, as I indicated he did he began that work in 1879 uh, in 1888, he was introduced. His ideas were introduced to the public schools in New York City, and that uh, began that was and that it began going that way. He eventually became a publisher and was he, the only thing he published was handwriting techniques called the Palmer method, which focuses on the drills that we the basic drills that we just looked at for these last few minutes. Last piece, just the. the it's interesting how technology has changed our need for the art of good penmanship. And those of us who have been at this for a while, you know, maybe it's a loss. But I, the, how many of you could name uh, more than one font? If I say a font, how many know what a font is? Okay. Can you name more than one font? Yes. Times. Times? And can you name? Times New Roman, Times Roman Serif, Sans Serif. Okay. Anybody else name some fonts? Helvetica. Okay, that's a good question. What is a font? A font is the name of the shape of uh, the letters in the alphabet. And different fonts are different groups of letters, alphabets, are grouped into font sets. Until uh, until the middle 80s, 1980s, the only people who really cared about fonts were guess. Uh, nope, didn't care. Anybody who published on paper, New Papers, uh, the uh, 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 Harcourt Brace, uh, the different people who published books, and they studied fonts in certain ways, saying which fonts are easier to read and which fonts are different, more difficult. And that the the one the, the, just a real uh, sidebar. Fonts with serif, those are the little hangy things. You know, a T, this, this would be a serif T or a capital T. These little hangy parts here are called serifs. And a font with a serif is actually easier for the eye to read than a font without a serif. Okay, and so and they learned that, so they started creating them. Well, then why did they start making things sans serif? Why did they take them away? Anybody know? When it's displayed on a computer screen, the pixels aren't small enough to show all of the serifs. So it makes the makes the makes the in the when they started doing it, it makes the fonts look different. And so rather than rather than uh, deal with just uh, the, that issue that it doesn't work, they change the fonts. And so that that comes about, and that and that's that's just a direct result of technology taking over in place. Um, Ed talked a bit about you know my challenging myself uh, in in the physical therapy piece, and one of the ways that I ch and, and I mean I work hard at what I do, uh, because I know that uh, if I if I sit back and wait just like some of you you know what it's like if you wait, you lose it, and so uh, I'm challenged with that, and I really work hard at the penmanship as well, and I would encourage you to you know to to try it. This paper is cheap. Color crayons are really fun, you know. They take you back to the good old days. You can, you know, after after you've drawn your your circles like here for a little while, you can draw some circles like this. So, but but practice. It's important as you make your practice. You want to think of things that friction helps. The crayon on newsprint is friction. You're having to push it. It's a little harder to do. Um, uh, the, the black pen on the whiteboard is very frictionless and is not hard to do. The challenge is, is to work yourself to exercise the muscle and the skill to make it better. That's pretty brief. and I think we're open for questions now if you'd like to do that. Anybody want to try the board? Don't everybody jump at once.
by the time they get it, say it's got five or six words in it, by the time they get to the end, the, the letters have been cut in half, and they trim them down so they finally get to the point you can't tell what they are. Is that typical of everybody or just part of it? That, that's typical of people who don't write enough. You know, it, as you know, if if you write, if if writing is your habit, and and I mean, instead of using the keyboarding, instead of uh, using some other method, if your habit is to 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 apply the skill all the way through, then it's going to work. But Parkinson's really accelerates that because we, as as we're doing, it's hard. Let's face it, it's hard for us to come up and write these letters. The and and it's easier for us to start moving down here smaller. And Ed, you're describing exactly what happens to all of us. Uh, with, with Parkinson's is that it, we, we tend to say, hey, you know, it's, it's harder and harder and harder, and our fingers start moving slower and slower and smaller and smaller, and the letters get that way. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Uh, in the last couple of months, my wife and I have each had mild strokes, and that really affects your writing. Yes. And uh, I was thinking, you know, we've come to the computer age where everybody signs everything, and that's proof of your identity and all that. When you just go like that, boom, you might find yourself in one about two or three days. Questions, please? Yeah, what do we need to do to make sure you hear the questions? Repeat them, please. Thank you. I understand. Yeah, Ed, Ed is describing the scenario where um, he... Uh, his hands have, have gotten to the point that they're grow growing smaller and smaller. They're, as he writes a sentence from left to right, it gets smaller and smaller. Go ahead, Ed. Yes, like I, says, I said to the people here in their class, uh, my wife and I have both had mild strokes in the last month or so, and it's affected our writing even, even more. And I was thinking now, as, a, as a, it's personal to us now, it's going to be with the computer age and everybody. everything's being done on paper and you sign the receipt and you sign this and you, uh, and uh, it's going to be way more important that we can keep our penmanship more or less consistent so that people can tell whether or not you uh, it's you or not. Was there a question that came in or just asked, asked to repeat the question? Okay, that's right. Anybody else? Has everybody uh, got enough questions? First, I, I need to qualify something here. I just need to be gone, le le moving uh, by 3.15. My plane actually is at 4.30. So you've got some time to ask questions if you want to do that. Good practice, and I see some people here are working hard at this. We Think have about a using question your elbow. here at Coeur d'Alene. Go ahead, Coeur d'Alene. Hello. Go ahead. We have a question. What is your What is your view on using manuscript writing and versus cursive? The um, first of all, any any kind of penmanship that you use, be it manuscript or cursive, that's legible is what you need to use. The advantage of the cursive is that it flows easily from from letter a, from left to right, letter beginning letter to last letter. But uh, again, if you if you're more comfortable doing manuscript, there's nothing wrong with manuscript. Uh, if you're interested, the uh, have access to um, the internet. You can look up what's called handwriting without tears, which basically this is what I showed you. Here. I showed you earlier. Then uh, earlier I showed you that it's essentially a vertical a ma a cursive that's based on manuscript, and it's very easy to use, and it's be it's becoming a significantly popular cursive handwriting uh, uh, font in schools today. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. The, uh, it's uh, handwriting without tears. On the computer. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, I'll um yeah H W tears, www.hwtears.com. And and I'm not necessarily saying it's better or worse, but it happens to be what is seems to be coming up. 
Okay, let's uh, have some questions from out in the television land. Our first one, I don't know if Anchorage got hooked up today or not. Anchorage, are you out there? Yes, we are, and we Good. don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Did you get a chance to practice? Um, most of us were just drawing on the table top, so... All right. um, I understand how that works. That's a good that answer. That reminds me of grade school. So we're not leaving any, any scars. There you go. Okay, the next one is Billings, Montana. Anybody have a question in Billings? Thank you very much. No questions? Presentation. Okay, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Are you out there, Coeur d'Alene? No further questions. Thanks. What was that question? No further questions, she said. No further, okay. Did you, did you miss no further that? questions. Oh, over in Coeur d'Alene on the 27th, they're going to have that class. If you need more details about the class, about medicines and Parkinson's, right here's the phone number, 2490-473-2490. That's our office, and they'll mail you out anything you need to know or whatever. Okay, now we're going to Clarkston, Washington. Yes, um, do you have any exercises for the hand that you would suggest that we do in order to, to get that uh, movement going? The, um, are you saying the hand is rigid, has gone in dyskinesia? Is that what you're suggesting, or...? Yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. Yeah, if the, if, um, Brian, can we get the screen here? Can I get the Elmo? There you go. If you if you um, are, is this the motion you want to work on? Yes. Yes, she says yes. Okay. The part of what I'm saying is is that. This motion can be, and especially in Parkinson's patients, can be counterproductive. But I mean, the exercise is much the same. If you sit here and you, you draw your circles, and I can't do it near so well because that's where my Parkinson's is. But if you start focusing on your elbow instead of your hand, that gives you a lot more control. Large, muscles, large muscle control is significantly uh, improved. Now, the... the um, the question is, do, are there specific exercises for the hand? First of all, it, it's just tra practice your alphabet. Second, the forward rolls, the backward rolls, and the push-pulls. Push-pulls are really hard. If you, if you try to do that with your hand, you'll see that what happens is you plant your... I'm, I'm going to move my hand out here. You plant your heel of your hand here, and you rotate off of the heel of your hand. And so that, that cramps your hand, and then you rotate off the heel of your hand. That's not good. That's not good for you. You want again want that whole hand to move with your arm. And you can't. I guess it's difficult for you to see. All you can get to see is my hand. My whole arm is moving here. I'm drawing with my elbow. Okay. And if I need to go over to the other whiteboard a bit, I'll do that. I'm not sure that's the best answer, but that's, a, that's the answer I'm going to have to give you on the hand, hand exercises. Again, practice is what it takes to make it better. Thank you. Okay, next we have, uh, next we have Colfax, Washington. Anybody down in Colfax? Nobody in Colfax. Okay, Dayton. Anybody down in Dayton? Yes, we enjoyed your program. I personally, myself, would like to make a statement. You're on the right track with your, uh, with your exercises, your writing exercises. I uh, had a memory come to, to me one day, and I was having trouble writing. And I went to school during the 40s, in elementary, and we had penmanship in those days. And a Dr. Rice, I think his name was Dr. Rice, it was Rice anyway, was the publisher or was the author of a penmanship book. And those things all come flying back to me one day. I've had Parkinson's for 10 years, and it was about five years ago it came to me, and it, it really helps. I don't write well, but I can write a little bit. 
and it's been a big help. And I, I, I compliment you on your what, what you're doing. You're doing a very good job. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate hearing when we're doing a good job. Next of all, we have Grand Cooley. No, excuse me. Grand Cooley's not on today. Uh, Grangeville, Idaho, Syringa Spring General Hospital. You out there? Yes, we're here, and we have no questions, but we think it's very interesting and uh, worthwhile. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Kennewick, Washington. Anybody in Kennewick? Okay, we're going on to Kirkland, Kirkland Evergreen. One more chance for Kirkland at Evergreen. Okay, OMAC. Are you out there, OMAC? Yeah, we're here. We made it through the New Year's, Ed. Uh, everything is fine. Uh, appreciated your... your uh, program today. Thank you. Good. It's something we all need. We all need to be able to read and write and keep up with the times. So, Othello, Washington, Community Hospital. Are you out there, Othello? Okay, we'll go to Pendleton, Oregon. You're at an awful disadvantage for this class. It says you're getting the audio only. How do you audio uh, the rolls? <laughs> Not something you can tell in, in words. It's got to practice. Okay, Pendleton, are you out there, Pendleton? We've been, yeah, we've been practicing our penmanship just like you have been on the board, but we're not quite sure what yours looks like. Ours looks pretty good. There you go. Okay, thank you. That's the nice thing about radio is you can look great and everybody knows. Nobody knows for sure. <laughs> Fort Townsend. Well. <laughs> Anybody out there at Fort Townsend? And they didn't answer. I left a message. They may be out of town, huh? And then uh, I called them. Uh, okay. Uh, Ritzville, Washington. Are you out there, Ritzville? Her mother, oh, she's from Florida. She oh. watches her there oh, really? all the time. Oh, that's too bad. So she's really important. Is that really continues on his? Okay. Uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. I think he finished it. Oh, did he? Yeah, just a month. Oh, is that all? But it's every day. But it's four days a week, an hour of and you time, and I. Oh, you. Is it, well, OMAC is OMAC is your mic mic on? Well, I didn't want to. Well, I think it's on now, but it wasn't. Okay, we're here at somebody else, and we thought you're you're showing on the display, so I thought it might be you. Okay. Uh, what about Sandpoint, Idaho? Did we ever find anybody in Sandpoint? Okay, Seattle, Virginia Mason. Okay, Walla Walla. Yes, uh, when I was in elementary school, I was a straight-A student, but I always got C's and D's in uh, penmanship, and I started to blame it on my left hand, which I've done most of my life. Is that a cop-out, or does it really make a difference? Do you write with your left hand? Do you write with your left hand? Are you... Yes. The, yes. Uh, the... the... First of all, if, if you want to, one of the nice things about handwriting without tears is that it doesn't uh, play play favorites with lefty, lefties or righties. But the problem with left-handers, if you can, I put, it, for those who have never been a left-hander, is what happens is as you write, your hand comes and follows along behind on the ink, smearing the ink. And so what ends up happening is the bottom of your hand, your heel of your hand, ends up with all covered with kinds of ink. But the bottom, but the end result is, if you want to practice that way with your left hand, it works exactly the same way. 
you know, and it's not something, you know, and I can, I can make this motion and work left-handed really well. If you, if you get away from the idea of slant, which was one of the tough things that lefties had to do, they had to turn their paper so darn around, far around to get it to work, that it, it looks like they were writing sideways on the paper, if you remember that. But the, uh, again, if, if the, those exercises, if you, if you want to practice, don't worry about the smear because those, those pens that we had to write with in those days, those good old pens that your hand would get all, they don't, they're better inks now. Does that address your... I issue? don't write... <laughs> Go ahead. Any other questions here in Spokane then? You got any questions here in Spokane? I've got one for you, George. Is there any letters that we should kind of avoid that they're difficult to make and they, of course, if it's in your signature, you better leave all the letters in there. They'll report you out for out of jail. <laughs> I'll bet you two of them that everybody knows. Q and Z. Okay. Q and Z are, and it's just the shape is the challenge to that. But the, if you're left, right-handed, you know, you're moving, your, your hand moves from, moves, you're writing on the left-hand side of your hand and your hand is moving to the right, so you're not smearing that letter. But again, the, the two toughest ones because there are lots, there's lots of verticality in that Q and the Z. If you remember the Q, it looks kind of like a two. And the Z looks like a reverse Y. Um, those are the two challenging ones. Has anybody, that, to the best of your knowledge, had handwriting got so bad that they tried to change over, become a lefty? Well, my brother tried, tried went switch from a lefty to a righty, and it didn't work, you know. And there are some people whose handwriting becomes so bad that they should stop writing. My dad's one of them, so he just. He's a doctor. He yeah, that's right. Excuse. That's right. He, <laughs> so, sir. Injury to my right arm uh, at one time. I had it, I was uh, incapacitated with the use of my right arm for a long time, and learned. So I learned to write with my left hand. And uh, later in my later life, I've been a teacher, and I stand at the board and talking to a class, and I'll start talking writing with my right hand, and I'll switch over and start writing my left hand. Confused look on yep. face. Hey, how did he do that? Very good. That's and that's that's a good anecdote. Still, that's. Good. Did, did you ever did you become facile enough with the left hand that you felt comfortable? It really doesn't matter. Repeat the questions, same? please. My, thank you very much. Very good point. We had a story. Go ahead. She, she wanted us to repeat the question. You remember what? Yes. Do I, we had we had a gentleman in in the Spokane. Um, uh, center who was who was uh, gave an anecdotal story, uh, saying that he had injured his left or pardon me his right arm at one point in time when he was younger, and, and it had an extensive time where he couldn't use it, so he actually taught himself to write with his left hand. So he he has he was then capable of writing both left-handed writing and right-handed writing, and then he then when he was teaching, he would work on the board and start the sentence with or the description in his left hand. And move across to the center point, and then move to his right hand, teaching on the board, and, we, and that's an example. That, and he and he indicates that he can write easily in both hands today. That was that was what was discussed. Did that help? It wasn't voluntary. The Catholic nuns made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't voluntary. The Catholic nuns made him do it. He says. That was a good one. Any other questions? We've got plenty of time now. I rushed you right on through here. Remember, there's coffee. Uh, there's still cookies back there. Yeah. There's coffee and cookies back there. Anybody wants to go get them? Okay. Now I better talk about what's going to be coming up next month. Thanks, Ed. You bet. Thank you, George Amon. Yep. Thank you. He is one of those real serious. Uh, exercise guys and he's he's showing good he's doing better and better all the time i wish i had that mental attitude that i wanted to sharpen the edge all the time next month is going to be lindy wood she's uh, working on her doctorate degree in fact she has one already and she's after another one 
out here with the WSU School of Pharmacy, and she'll be on the program for next month. And she'll be bringing with her Steve Setter, and they will talk on kind of that same thing they're going to get over there in, the, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The medicines used in Parkinson's, uh, how they interact, how, what they are good with, and, and how, what one might be effective for you. So that is a real nice gimmick there. Okay. Uh, Yeah, they're always going to be on the second. Uh, uh, St. Luke's is having uh, job introductions and whatnot on that other week, so they need this place for that day. For uh, I started to say interrogation. I don't think it's, that's the way <laughs> it's done. But anyway, the examples of how to be a good employee. So uh, Again, I want to remind everybody of the people that sponsor us. St. Luke's Rehab here gives us this room every month. Northwest Parkinson's over in Seattle is a very uh, helpful in paying for the airtime. Albertson's pays up for the uh, uh, some of the actual testing that's going to be going on this time. By the way, that uh, dance program that we held was quite successful. We'll probably do it again next year. Uh, it's uh, it's going to work out real well. It's starting in February. I just found out. Now that is this year, isn't it? All right. <laughs> When you got it, you got it, you know. This year is next year over. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll call this meeting to adjourn. This is the uh, January edition of the PRC, Parkins Resource Center of Spokane's Education uh, Program. And while I've got you right on the phone, I'll just, uh, on the air here, I'll just ask you a quick question. Do you like us holding it in this same area of an education meeting, or would you prefer to have a, a, a support group more atmosphere? We're, we're coming here trying to project to you the new stuff that's in the field, and then you can digest it and do whatever you want to do with it. Um, by the way, I also went last Thursday and met the new uh, neurologist up at the Rockwood Clinic, Dr. Minnick. And uh, he seemed quite a pleasant fella, and uh, uh, he's looking for business, and I'm, he'll be talking to us in a couple months. So uh, the more, more people we get, the more experiences we can have, and you might just resonate with somebody, and bingo, it makes a difference. So, And with that, I'm going to say goodbye, everybody. See you next month.